Hey, good day, everyone. This is Shata Garcia Mejia, Global Solutions Specialist from Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. And I'm here today with a very special guest that HMH has worked with for years and years, uh, the head of St. George School, Mr. Anton Tejada. So um, I have a lot of questions for you today, but I wanted to just tell you that this morning I was reading Ed Week. I don't know if you saw that. It came out this morning and I was looking at um, a couple of things that they were saying, five to 20% cuts are, are projected for every district across the board. If yeah. there's not a stimulus um, directly aimed at uh, public education. So that's the first data that just, whoa, kind of hit me in the face. And when we look at the data, when you have deep cuts, Every single time those deep cuts happen, it doesn't matter what type of system that you're in, you can expect slow to no academic progress. Yeah, I, I, uh, good morning, Shat, and thank you so much uh, to you and to Houghton Mifflin for, for inviting me to this uh, fire set, fireside chat here, even though we don't have, I don't have a fireplace, but uh, it's, it's very warm here. Um, you know, uh, I think you you mentioned something that's that's very important, and it's the direct stimulus to either private schools or public schools or districts. Um, in uh, in my country, in the Dominican Republic, we do not have as of yet any direct stimulus to address uh, uh, private education. And what's happening is, as you know, a big difference between Latin America and the and the United States is that. Uh, a good percentage, around 25% of the population here attends private schools. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the impact is uh, much larger. I was reading in an article that in the United States, I think it's only 10% of the population attends private schools of the student population, about 10%. Right. So 90% is public, 10% is private. Here, it's uh, about 25, maybe 30% is private, the balance is public. Mm -hmm. And so in the private sector, what's happening is that uh, as many of these parents are are being affected economically by by the stoppage, um, they're asking schools to discount 30, 40, 50 percent. Oh, okay. And, uh, okay. So it's not even, you know, discount 5 percent. Most private schools here have been talking to the parents association, have been making adjustments for families that need specific help, you know, maybe with with, you know, payments and, and making them longer or postponing okay. payments till September. Right. But there are other people that are very much affected and 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 are are probably gonna have to really analyze whether they, they will be able to stay in the private school system. Um, and my fear, just like you're saying, is that that is going to directly affect the quality of the education provided. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know of any school system, whether it's public or private, that can take a 20% cut yeah. Without, without going into the bone, as you say, right? It's going yes. to affect. It's going to affect professional development for sure, right? Oh, yeah, it's, absolutely. I think, I think the teachers that remain will have more hours, more right. grade levels, more responsibility, right. possibly even right. some administrative or or supervisory uh, positions. You know, uh, mm -hmm. and that's also going to increase. Uh, stress levels amongst teachers, and it's right. going to decrease morale. So it's really like you know. The oh, perfect oh, another quick people. question. Here's a quick question, right there, right there. It's part of my questions anyway. So when you think about that, the cuts that are already in your head, swirling around, things you need to do, you know, you need to cut. How many of these systems do you think are going to use data to find? where the um i'm gonna say scarcities are and when i say scarcities that means this 15 minutes of time when i've set aside this thing but it's really not happening in the classroom or we've yeah. developed this program but only five kids are enrolled or something like that like like how many systems do you think and leaders of that you know are going to base that on like looking at that scarcity data and how many are just going to say, oh, okay, we just got to cut off the top. We just need to start, you know, like you say, just, just slash the bone. What do you think? Well, the answer that I have to that question is, is not a fun answer. Yeah. <laughs> it really is not. And I'll tell you why. I think one of the things that we've seen worldwide, not even in the United States or Latin America, worldwide is that 
I would say the vast majority of schools were not ready to go into uh, uh, virtual education. Many schools had platforms or whatever LMSs that they work off, but still, even their teachers weren't, uh, you know, very versed in how to manage the platforms or even how to translate education from 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 live in classroom to a virtual, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, as we spoke last week, right? Yes, These yes. things. So that tells us that most schools really aren't that technologically advanced, mm -hmm. and. I was talking to uh, a supplier, a, a, another educational company yesterday, and they're saying, we have reams of data, reams. We just can't analyze it. We don't have the wherewithal to analyze the data. So I think something that's become evident now is that schools are seeing, hey, uh, the platforms, the technology really does have a function. Mm -hmm. I know everybody's arguing now that you know, education in school is much better than the virtual education. I agree with that, but it's what we have at this particular juncture, right? And schools have said, whoa, you know, it's better than closing the school. So mm -hmm. data and the data analysis, I think it's going to be a huge area of school administration as we move forward. Mm -hmm. And schools or districts or institutions that are able to break up the data and really see where they have inefficiencies, uh will be the successful institution now mm. how do we do that i'm not i'm not really sure um you know that would mean for example in, in the case of my school i can tell you we've been working for a year on a data manager so we're going to have a person that's only analyzing data uh assessments national assessments map exams ib results uh even internal assessments uh and trying to see how that person is only going to be focused on what are the trends and what is the analysis telling us and where are we weak? But, you know, that's a new administrative position that was not last year. It did not exist. So in, at the same time that schools are looking to cut costs, we are also going to have to really face reality and say, OK, we need some new people in some new areas. And one of them, I think, has to be that data analysis, data management. Uh, data intelligence so that you know you know your your decisions can be evidence based and but yeah. it's, it sounds much easier in theory like i'm telling you now it says oh yeah you know wonderful let's do that yeah but in practice i find i find that it's it's uh, it's complicated um, yeah, in my head, I'm thinking, who's that magical person that's going to be able to blend, you know, this this data perception, I like to call it when they look at the data, big picture or small picture and are able to formulate, you know, trends right away, micro trends. So that person and they know education so well to know, OK, so this micro trend relates to um, uh, a, a deficiency in, in this part of, of reading instruction. Like, wow, that'd be amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the bad side of the answer is that I think that the majority of schools are just going to cut, like you were saying, without really, you know, <laughs> without really taking uh, a thought as to where are we cutting uh, and what's necessary. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to say to you, this data guru, as as we're saying, right? It's probably it's going to be as 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 common as a curriculum coordinator in schools as we move forward, right? Uh, and it's going to be that that person that is kind of providing the curriculum coordinator, the principals, and even the academic dean if the school has an academic dean with data, you know. And there's there's going to be the human side of education, which is still teachers and how do I feel and my students and so on and so forth. And then there's going to be kind of this quantitative, you know, hard facts uh, base, and hopefully we can blend them together. But yeah. we're not, I'm not there yet. Our school is not there yet. We're trying to move in that direction. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, so you know, your, just... question, your question is, is really good in the sense that yesterday we had a leadership meeting in my school and we're like, how do we cut costs without affecting the quality of the education or, right. our, or our values in terms of education? Because yeah. you have a school community and some are having problems, but some are saying, hey, I'm in this school because I have an expectation for the education that my child will receive, whether it's virtual or, or in the school. So mm -hmm. it's a challenge. Yeah, it's going yeah to be a for, challenge. Sure. for sure. I just heard yesterday that Denver Public Schools, where I live, are going 50-50 um, blended. 
And it sounds like they're doing that K-12. So half of the students will be attending in class and the, and the other half of their education will, will continue to be online. Um, they did a mad rush because they were not set up for digital <laughs> to, to get Chromebooks and to establish Wi-Fi for every student in the district, which they did within a week and a half, which I think was just stellar. Incredible. How did they do that shot? That did they give them uh, devices, or how did how did they provide the, uh, the Wi-Fi for the kids? Device giveaway. You would show up with your car, and in your trunk, you would open your trunk, and then the staff member would put in however many Chromebooks, whatever hotspots, Wi-Fi devices. Yeah, it was it was all that, and they did that for every student, and they did that to ensure um, two things. One thing was that students could have access to all the common apps that they're now expecting them to use and here's the other the other question that i had for you is that there has been this bonanza this mad wild west rush to open education resources now i mean before it was just you know teachers pay teachers and a couple other things but now it's all of these online apps and websites and social emotional learning and you know i looked at the top 50 districts there was so much of that all over and none of it was related to the district it was just this open education resource they expected students to use in the course of their pdf packets that they emailed students once a week for that whole week for every um part of their education with a recommended schedule even Right. So, um, so my question is, what have you guys done in terms of when you went virtual? Did you did you jump into this pool of, of all these free resources or, or what did that look like at your school? All right. Well, well, first of all, uh, the Dominican Republic, we went uh, we closed schools March 12th. Okay. And by March, I would say 17th, more or less, we were up and running on the on a virtual platform. We, we have an LMS um, at, at our school that we use Canvas, and uh, we have about 120 teachers. And, it, you know, it's kind of ironic, Shata, because six months before, I had had a meeting with the staff, and I had said, listen, guys, I want to do a pilot with a virtual classroom. <laughs> and I want to I do this pilot, you know, and see how it goes. So we we're going to do it in, eighth, in ninth grade math. I remember clearly. And of course, you know, I was in this, I was in this conference room with the, with the teachers and you can imagine the faces of the teachers and the rolling of the eyes. And, you know, this is, oh God, this is, this is not possible and it's going to be more work and this and that. Right. <clears throat> and the irony is of course, that all 120 teachers had to go online um, within seven, five days, five to seven days. And we did it. And every day it got better. And there was a learning curve, both for parents, both for students and for the teachers and even the, the principals. And what we found was that there's a correlation between age and effectiveness. So it's, it's basically a 45 degree curve going up to the right. And the younger you are, the less effective uh, virtual education is. So if you look at an XY graph, right, at that corner would be preschool or infant school. And as you go to upper school or 12th grade, it, the effectiveness goes up because the kids can study more on their own. Uh, they're more independent. Whereas in primary and preschool, the parent has to be sitting next to the child and being their, their teacher, basically. And, and that's part of the inefficiency of that aspect, right? Yes. So one of, the, one of the concerns that we have is, okay, if we have to move on, if we have to continue with virtual education, like you said, Denver and next year, what's going to happen with the younger kids? And mm -hmm. we are also looking at the possibility of doing uh, a blended program in which in order to keep the number of students per classroom, 10, 12, something like that, then maybe we would have a, a, a schedule where Monday and Wednesday, we have 50% of the school come in. Tuesday and Thursday, we have another 50% of the school come in. And then Fridays can perhaps be for special ed or for people who need uh, some sort of, um, of extra help. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is that 
the resources, like you were saying, there's thousands and thousands of resources. We call them, <laughs> we call them Padlets and we've uploaded them up to Canvas and we have them, you know, by grade or by school or by subject even, you know, math, these are the, and what I find Ashata is that it's overload. People aren't using them. Yes. And, 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 and basically the students will use what the teacher assigns. So when we have, uh, you know, we have, you know, I don't know, 45 links to different Padlets or resources. If the teacher does not buy in to that particular resource, the kids won't use it. They're basically, the kids are taking their cue from the teachers, what to use and what not to use. So yes, there's an overload. I think, you know, not to, not to quote that famous phrase, but there's a lot of fake news. So there's a lot of fake uh, resources yeah. that, you know, promise great results. And at the end, eh, you know, so you, you need a, you need a resource curator in your school. You need somebody to say, okay, we're going to use these five resources, you know, for language arts, for maths, for history, but these are the ones and, and please don't, don't go looking for more. This, these are right. the ones, you're right. right. And, um, and you talked about the correlation between age and effectiveness. Right now, let's transfer that conversation to teachers. Have you seen a correlation between teacher effectiveness online and teacher age or, or years of experience, I'd rather say? Well, we, we, we have done several surveys to parents. Uh, we're working on a survey now for teachers and we're working on a survey now for the students. Okay. The, the, the fact of the matter is that, yes, you know, the older, more established teachers are, uh, th 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 they're no longer refusing to use technology because there is no option, right? So they have to use technology. What we found is some of the more older or traditional teachers, but of course, there's always exceptions, you know, it's not a, it's not a, a generality, but right. what we've seen is that they will upload PDFs or they will go in a synchronous class and they'll basically talk like they were in a, in a classroom, you know? And, and so there's no uh, collaboration. Some of the kids might even turn off their cameras, you know, or, or start doing something else, you know, uh, with their phone. Right. Um, and what we've seen is that the teachers that take this as a, as a kind of a fun challenge, they tend to do better. You know, those, those teachers that, that have lost the fear of of uh, of the of the technology, they tend to do better, and they have they're more dexterous in how they use the the internet to engage the students. Right? The problem is student engagement. But I have yeah. to say to you, if overall, I think it's been a great thing for old, young, youngish, whatever you know, very experienced, non experienced teachers, because everyone has throw has been thrown into the reality of technology, and so. In the past, as I said to you, that little story where I said, let's do a pilot and all the old teachers were like, oh God, and here we go again. <laughs> right. And so that, that we've overcome. And so I feel like there's been a shift and everyone has learned more. Everyone has learned more and is more, well, has more ability, go. has more ability with technology. The old, the younger, the, the, the you know, the, the, the cool teachers who know, you know, know how to use the internet or whatever, maybe they do a little bit more, but I think everyone has shifted to the, to the right in terms of, of, of knowledge of what we can do with the, with the internet and the fear has been lost. You know, it's like you're forced to do this. And so there's no option. You got to do it, you know? Right. Um, right. And uh, well, the interesting part to me of what you just said is that, you know, if I'm one of those veteranos and, and I'm creating these PDFs at home, Wow, boy, am I taking a bunch of time to do that. And if I'm another younger teacher who's into some digital platforms, maybe I'm creating a Prezi that's going to tell the story of everything that would have, that would have occurred with the, the PDF that I'm putting online. And I could have just played that and my kids would have been 10 times more interested. So it's the, it's the like, you know, work smarter, not harder. Because uh, yeah, yeah. these older teachers, they don't know what they're missing. If we could just show them how easy it is, if they would just take the time to learn this new skill, man, then then we can really get them going. That's what I've that's what I've found. It's it's interesting that you say that. Though. 
I, I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that has to be acknowledged uh, is that teachers are working harder. Yes. I think there's no doubt that teachers are working harder, uh, mm -hmm. not only smarter, but harder. And, you know, uh, one of the negative things about technology is that there's that immediate feedback, right? And so, for example, I have administrative responsibilities in my school. Mm -hmm. And when I say, okay, guys, let's do a survey on the, on the parents to see how they feel about the virtual education program. And I want to do the same thing with teachers and with students. They don't like it because it's immediate feedback, quick, immediate feedback on what they're doing. And it's not 100% objective, but it's indicative. And it gives you an idea of what's going on. And I think teachers don't don't enjoy that. They don't like that. So technology also is providing that system or that that ecosystem, right? Where we, you know, now everybody wants to have immediate gratification and we want to know right away, okay, you, you did the class right away. Is it good or bad? I don't know. You know, I use a lot of Zoom. Now, after every Zoom meeting, there's a little survey that says, was the meeting good or bad? You know, hands up or hands down. Everything is immediate. <laughs> So I'm sure the Zoom people are like, you know, looking at all this data and saying, okay, we got today we got 75% thumbs up. And that's what we're getting, you know, with education. And I think it's something that we have to be careful with, you know, because oh, yeah. the human aspect of education is, I, I, I think it's almost like going to school, right? Versus virtual education. Mm -hmm. That connection, the humanity of education cannot be lost. But I do think that technology uh, will provide us with uh, evidences and data that we can perhaps use to tweak uh, and to do things better. I don't like and I don't want education to become, you know, a machine or, or you know, uh, artificial intelligence and all the data, you know, kind of spewing out what kids want to hear, what they should do based on data. And, and, and I don't want it to get there, but I think that I think there's been a, a shift, you know, and, and, and I see it to a certain degree with optimism about what we will be able to do and how hopefully we can be a little bit more efficient and publishing companies like yourself, right? Providers of educational content mm -hmm. have to shift along with the reality of the shift that's going on. Right. So, right. um, I, I, I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I think that it's clear that there's going to be a great number of opportunities for the different players in education systems, whether it's university, publishers, teachers, administrators, you know, professional development. There's going to be areas, and whoever can figure that out first, let's hope it's not Amazon, right? But whoever can figure that out first, <laughs> that's all we need. Amazon yeah. schools. Uh, you know? Oh my God. But that's what we're talking about is, is innovating with the the customers the folks that need to be able to be proficient at um at all of these different skills and what's interesting is that you know in the last few years all of us publishers have gotten to the point where we can tell you where the standards are where the skills are where they match up in all of our textbooks and how we can meet that need and that's really good for right now because now teachers can take that and actually use that as actionable data for them, because here's the thing that I did not like as a, as a um, dual language principal was the time that it took me to teach my teachers how to look at the data, then the time that it took me to pull the data out of my teachers once they looked at it, then the time that it took me to collaborate with my instructional coaches over that data. Like by the time all of us took that, took all of those steps, wow. We were exhausted and the data was actionable. We did a good job, but man, that took such a long time. And so you have to ask yourself whether it was effective, right? Exactly. Because it if you took, if, if, if you, it took you three or months or six months to be able to actually get to, to some action, maybe the, the circumstances of the students had already changed by the time you implemented that action. That's exactly right. And you know that you're, you're a teacher. I mean, you're an ex teacher. You know that that word time, right? Time. It's like, it's like money uh, for teachers. It's, it's what everybody complains about. And again, yet another area of opportunity is teachers should be teaching. Teachers should be focused on the students 
And another area of educational institutions should be doing data analysis uh, and thinking about that data, not necessarily, I'm not saying keep the teacher away from the decision making, but don't burden the teacher with that task. The task of the teacher is in the classroom and then provide perhaps with this wonderful, mysterious data that somehow we're going to come up with, right, through technology. Mm -hmm. Right. And feed strategies, you know, and say, look, this is the evidence and, and just trust me, go with this, you know, um, and hopefully the idea is to have actionable strategies, mm -hmm. evidence based in mm -hmm. a quick, you know, and when I say quick, I mean, like a few days, a week, not six months, you know, not mm -hmm. let's do a committee to let's do okay. a committee to create, you know, and analyze the data. And then that that's three months. And okay, now let's do another committee. <laughs> yeah, now let's do another committee to decide, okay, what strat now that we understand the data, what strategies are we gonna do? And 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 you know, by the time you finish this these sets of committees, you wonder and you say to yourself, why did we start? What was the original, you know, reason to do this? That's um right. and that's I think right. I think teachers, if we could find it, again, I'm telling you things, but I don't know how exactly to do it. I think that mm -hmm. there have to be people in an organization, education organization that are that are only thinking about these types of things. Yeah. Um, and ideally, they need to be teachers. They need to be ex teachers, not in the classroom, but they need to be people who can say, OK, this data, how do I translate this to strategies right. in the classroom? Yeah, because if you didn't struggle in your own classroom, looking at your own data with your own students, it's hard to transfer that to this, you know, mega data um type of scope of understanding yeah completely get that all right anton final thoughts what do you think well i mean the situation is so dire that i think the only reasonable strategy is to be optimistic Ooh, i like that uh you know i think that uh as i said many people have learned and are learning an enormous amount of abilities that they didn't they're mastering certain abilities that they didn't have in in their toolbox before um i think that's going to be good for for teachers throughout the world because they've elevated you know they're out of a plateau and they're out of the comfort zone mm -hmm. um everybody's in the same boat so teachers don't feel you know like oh my god i'm the only one who doesn't know how to use this or or i'm the only one who doesn't know how to do this well there's a lot of support so it's been a kind of a lab, you know, an opportunity for everyone to move up. I yeah. think that I think that uh, virtual education or digital education ideas of blended environment in the classroom. I think it's I don't think it's going anywhere. I think it's going to become I, I've said it before. I think it's going to become a, a part of a toolbox for schools and for teachers where uh, for differentiation purposes, for uh, reinforcement purposes. Uh, from mm -hmm. kids who are absent from school or whatever, uh, or even if we have another outbreak, you know, we have another outbreak and we need to close schools for a little while. It's like, exactly. okay, we're, we, we have this other tool and we right. will no longer, you know, have to plan with five to seven days. What are we going to do? And the challenge <laughs> that, that, that I think most schools have now is, okay, having learned what we've learned in the last month and a half, eight weeks, mm. How are we going to adjust uh, our virtual or digital uh, education learning strategy as of September uh, to be able to address the needs of the students, the parents, and the teachers? Because at the end of the day, that's why these surveys are so important to really get a feeling for, for what's happening and where we need to fill in some holes, right? Or reinforce certain areas. That's right. Um, and that's I really don't think it's going to be like, this is how you use the, the platform, or this is, how, you know, this technology. I think it's really going to be more about, you know, how do we differentiate? How does a teacher differentiate when he's teaching a classroom live with kids in a classroom versus, hey, I'm teaching 20 kids through Zoom or through a digital platform? What right. changes does a teacher need to do in order to make that learning effective. And yeah. again, I think that's the intelligence that people like yourself and, and people who are in the in the market is what we're hopefully, you know, I'm hoping that when you come to see us in September, you say to us, listen, guys, this these are the five or 10 things that we feel 
teachers need to know when you're in a classroom versus when you're in a digital environment. And these are strategies that will help you uh, uh, connect with students. And, and uh, but you know, life will go on, uh, whether this new reality uh, is not what we expect or, or like, I think it's, you know, we will adjust and, and we will move forward. I think that uh, I would be very concerned if, for example, we said, well, in Latin America, all schools are digital and in the United States, you know, all schools are uh, open to students because somehow the US has something that we don't have in Latin America. So everybody would kind of leave Latin America and say, okay, I'm gonna go to school in the States. But right. it, we're all in the same, uh, we're all in the same boat and yeah. so, I don't think teachers, parents, or students have a lot of options. We have to make the best of mm. our our school community. Um, That's right. So you know, I really like your analogy of, of the toolbox because to me, all it is, it's, it's two things. It's a change of your toolbox. So I ha I've had a metal toolbox this whole time. Now I, had, now I need a polypropylene one. Right? <laughs> so yeah, you change yeah. your toolbox. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is to look at, you said, you know, asynchronous and synchronous um, blended as far as in class and out of class, and then take your three buckets. What are you doing for your intro, your engagement part of the lesson for every single subject? I don't care what. Then the content of your lesson relates to the standards and differentiates for your students and has them collaborate in a creative way. Teachers think they can't do that. There's so many ways to do that. It's just a different toolbox. That's it. You know, I want to give you a, a, a quick example. <clears throat> Let's think of a university like Harvard University. Do you honestly think that the, the professors at Harvard University are structuring and designing their classrooms, their digital classrooms I'm talking about. Do you honestly believe that? Or do you believe that those professors, as we know, the top of the top, creme de la creme, right? They're basically, they're basically investigating and they're still gonna come in and say, okay, this is what I know and this is, these are my findings. And whether it's a collaborative conversation with students or whether it's a, or whether it's a, a lecture, yeah. that professor, is not going to be worried about did the kids get it did they not get it was the connection stable was it not stable am i seeing all the kids at the same time that teacher is going to show up to that room i'm talking about synchronous learning at this particular example right, and he's right, going to yeah. show up and he's going to go into this little booth right and it's going to be it's all going to be set up and so he's just going to come in to deliver a class and of course try to maintain the connection with the students and making the material interesting. Yeah. But that teacher is probably going to have, that professor is probably going to have somebody helping him with the technical side of the connections. That teacher is probably going to have somebody helping him with Prezi presentations, uh, connections with, with other support, you know, that, that, that he might have for the class, um, right. for, for having polling, you know, all these kinds of things. And so I equate this almost like what it must have been like to make television. And so a teacher is a talent. You, mm -hmm. you show up at the, at, at the uh, studio <laughs> and you are talking head, you know, but everything else is structured so that there is a consistency in what, te in what the students at Harvard will see, regardless of who the teacher is. You understand? Yes, yes. yeah. And yeah. I think that that is very important because one of the problems that we have here is that every teacher wants to do things in a certain way and that's fine. There should be a room to, to move and to express yourself as a teacher. Yeah. But generally, there should be a standard that, that parents and students are going to become comfortable with. And when you, when you say to a student, today we will have synchronous learning, he should say, I know exactly what's gonna happen. And we say, okay, no, it's today's asynchronous learning. So, so that, um, that that world has to be very, very standard, very clear and the quality and consistency. And I, I, to me, that's what I think is going to happen a lot with teachers, you know? Um, oh, that's cool, that's cool. And I just think that again, when you go down in the grades, then you need more creative tools, more ways of engaging your students. Students have less of that, you know, kind of 
you know, grit and staying power to, to stay there with you and stay engaged. So that to me, that's the only difference is that, you know, if I'm a college professor, geez, I remember my time at CU Boulder, the guy could have been online the whole time <laughs> because that's how much of a connection I had with the professor. And, and it just seems like for some of those folks, it's, it's going to be super simple. My daughter's college, um, Colorado University in the fall, Three tiers. Tier one, classes that must be held on campus, a biology lab. Uh, tier two, blended learning that you could do, you know, one, one day here, the rest of it at home. And then tier three, totally remote learning. So, of course, they're not changing their, uh, you know, uh, rates that they charge all of us parents, <laughs> but, uh, but they're going to, they're going to change into three tiers. And and um, the the kids that don't need to be on campus won't be on campus. It's interesting. Yeah, I, I I like that idea, and I also like what you were mentioning about the Denver public schools and what they're what what they're thinking about doing. And with the you know, at a to a certain degree, you know, the cost of the schools, most of these schools, most of the cost is uh, teacher salaries and administration salaries. So the cost structure for for educational institutions is basically the same. Right. Um, I do think, though, that I like the idea of the Chromebooks and, and solving the Wi-Fi problem, the connectivity problem, because the school is essentially saying, I'm providing you with all the necessary tools to continue with the content. And I think that that is part of the commitment yes. that's, that institutions within you know, the pricing structure, we should be taking looking at that very seriously. Um, because we're trying to take problems away from the table, Shata, right? And, and, you know, um, and I guess one has to wonder what's going to happen, you know, five years down the road or whatever, whether in fact, you know, traditional schools, campuses are going to be necessary or whether it's really more of a, of a time sharing thing where you will go to certain areas to have that social interaction or the labs or whatever, but not necessarily these humongous, you know, uh, Institutions, I, I I really don't know, but I, I think that uh, we're we're at the beginning of a change, yes. a true change in in education. I, I don't think it's going to change in the next five years, but I I do think that that you know maybe in twenty years time we'll say you know it was in twenty twenty when there was a shift in education. There you go, there you go. And some of my friends have been saying. Well, geez, it's been 180 years. Isn't it about time? <laughs> yeah. 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 However, well, you time. know, just to, just, just to conclude, one final thought I want to add to that, Shad, that is that <laughs> I think there's a new appreciation for what schools and teachers do in homes throughout the world, right? Because yes. Yes. parents have been stuck with their kids and teaching yeah. their kids and so on and so forth. And so the, the, the social emotional connectivity that happens in a school is has a new value. The problem is, of course, if the governments around the world decree that, you know, collaborate, you know, how we talk about education, we say, let's collaborate, let's work in teams. And now that, of course, is not, uh, you know, the best. Yes. So, right. I don't know. Wow. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time, for your expertise, and for what you do every day for young kids in your area. Thank you very much for having me, Seth. I really much appreciate uh, conversing with you.